morning, everyone. Hopefully, everybody had a had a good uh, good Thursday and is ready to learn a little bit more environmental geosciences today. Um, if you have any uh, questions, feel free to email me. Uh, you can obviously uh, chime in on the chat box, although that's a little bit harder for me to, to see and respond immediately, but I'll, I'll get back to you soon. Um, I apologize, it took a little while to get the, the uh, audio lecture um, and recording posted the last time. It took, I couldn't have trouble getting it uploading to Carmen, but I have it sorted out. If you look on the Carmen page for our course, you'll see in modules, there's a lecture one recording that's present there, and uh, they'll be there every day, hopefully within just a few hours after class. It takes about an hour for my computer to process the lecture and convert it to the right file format, so uh, it'll probably be at least, at least that long. Um, as far as terms of the lecture slides, I see a question on the chat. The lecture slides are, are all online. They'll be posted on uh, typically on Sunday evenings for the whole week. So the lecture slides for today already have been online and uh, the uh, recording will be shortly after, um, after, the, after the course. So um, a little bit of this at the beginning of the class. If there are any questions, will be, a bit, will be somewhat of a review. Um, I'm gonna go through it quickly, but I wanna remind you that the three link concepts we're gonna try to integrate and most of our discussions throughout the semester are going to be linking human population growth, sustainability, and linked earth systems. And we're going to uh, sort of go over this again a little bit briefly in terms of human population growth, because quite frankly, this is one of the biggest issues facing society is how we sort of think about population growth and how we can sort of understand and, and prepare for the population that uh, the, the world's going to have to have to provide resources for in the future. So um, again, this type of curve is called an exponential growth curve. I think it's pretty uh, striking to realize, you know, how uh, that even the, in terms of, you know, obviously some of the billions of people on the y-axis, as recently as 10,000 BC, 12,000 years ago, the end of the last ice age, um, they basically had just a few hundred million people on, on planet Earth, and we've seen a pretty much exponential exponential growth curve throughout the last period of time, which is sort of inexorably going towards about a nine to ten billion people. So again, the exponential growth curve is how our population is increasing. A lot of this has come to the fact that we've developed the capacity to, to uh, innovate technologies, um, things like going from the Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, and clearly what actually contributed to the, the recent uh, exponential growth or, or the, the higher order exponential growth are things like developing agricultural crops, the ability to store foods, um, some basic medicine, the ability to mine precious metals, ores, et cetera, uh, have allowed us to sort of expand the number of, uh, industrialize and expand the number of people who are uh, able to get resources and as, and as a result, increase the number of, uh, of uh, children people are having. Uh, agricultural, um, agriculture in America is one of the big aspects where families had, you know, as an example, I should say, where families had something like eight and 10 kids on average, depending on the region, just to meet agricultural needs and during that time. And all of these have sort of contributed to exponential growth, but largely it's tied to, um, to uh, the development of technology, allowed that capacity to increase. Um, again, I, I highlight this here. Uh, maybe it's a little too uh, too close to home during a during a pandemic. Although we're doing a lot better than than the Black Death for certain, which is that the the one break in the exponential curve, of course, um, was uh, was related to um, the issue of, of Black Death uh, back in the back in the 1300s. I got a couple questions on this after the last lecture, so I just want to be clear uh, when we talk about growth rate. The few things I want to highlight here are that a growth rate at zero or less than zero, negative, implies we're no longer seeing an increase in population. Even a small fraction, 0.1, implies population is actually increasing. Um, and note that most of the developed countries, United States, uh, certainly Russia and, and, and Europe, uh, are either in the, uh, you know, the, the small, slightly positive to even negative population growths. Most of the uh, positive growth rates are really uh, rapid exponential growth rates are actually occurring on, on the continent of Africa, um, Southeast Asia, and some other parts of the Middle East in general. Um, but we're getting back to the actual growth rate, maybe I didn't uh, make enough time on this, it, that uh, reflects the population at time two. So let's just say population at time 2020 minus the population at some time in the past. So let's say uh, 2000, and that's multiplied by the population at, at time one, you know, 2000 in this example times T2 minus T1, which is the the number of years that have elapsed since you know, 2020 to 2000 in the example I've given. So key aspects here, uh, population growth is variable throughout the world. It's clearly um, large discrepancies, particularly in what um, we, we traditionally had called developing nations in Africa, uh, and, and now are, are uh, deemed to be more appropriate to call them uh, economically challenged or poor 
coordinations. So anything that's a positive value in a small fraction, point one is, a, is, is growth, negative value equals decline. And where this ties to is the, the fertility rate. So that, that again goes back to the number of children per, per woman. And you'll note that uh, nations like uh, you know, the United States, uh, a, lot of the, a lot of the developed worlds were, were in those sort of the zero to two children per woman or, or a fraction of a, of a child per woman to, to, to up to two uh, children, two to three children per woman. Um, mainly the, uh, the birth rates are much higher in those, in those areas where I described the population growth. Um, key aspect, and I know I'm covering this just as a review of last time, the key material, is that the fertility rate is, is pretty much directly correlated with, with GDP. You'll notice that the, um, the, the fertility rate, um, you know, sort of exponentially declines with uh, increasing per capita income. Uh, a few examples, primarily tied to Angola and Saudi Arabia, tied to economies with really large uh, uh, percentages of oil exports that sort of drive their, their GDP off of the off of the line. And maybe, you know, one would argue that some of those resources in those countries don't necessarily reach the general population. Um, I won't provide a comment on that, but that's something to think about. And then Israel has a relatively advanced economy, but a high fertility rate. Um, I won't go through these numbers in detail. We already talked about in the last lecture. But for perspectives, our current population is 330 million people, and we are going to pretty likely to reach 388 million people uh, by 2050. World population again by 2050. So that's that's uh, that's 30 years from now. That's it's clearly within your easily within your uh, in your working uh, career, uh, and probably uh, probably even 2060 is going to be within your working career. We'll we'll make the climb to 10 billion people before your for your careers are are over. Um, and, and those numbers are just sort of challenging to think about, which we'll come back to that. So just putting this all in perspective, how has this looked over the last, uh, the last uh, you know, uh, decade or, or, sorry, the last century or so, um, we came into, we you know, sort of ended World War II at about two and a half billion people. Um, so we talked about going from you know, a few hundred million to a billion between the last ice age 12,000 years ago and you know, modern era. But just in the last uh, century, we've gone from two and a half million people in the end of World War II, uh, with projections getting up to uh, close to nine to ten billion by by 2050. And uh, you can see here we've we've basically doubled in a time interval about every 40 years um, throughout that. And you'll note that if you if you go to three billion to six billion, most of that growth uh, rate has actually occurred up till about the year 2000. Um, and you'll notice that we're actually not set to double again until uh, well beyond 2050. So this actually highlights something that's relevant to think about and, and can be tied directly back to this fertility rate versus GDP, which is the fact that we're actually starting to see the population, the growth rates decrease, so the population still increasing. So uh, one of, the, one of the, uh, the diagrams really common in this type of uh, investigations in terms of populations are called, uh, some people call these uh, tornado plots. Uh, I don't know if you heard that term before, but basically, you can look at the distribution of, a, of the male and female population relative to various age brackets over here. And that'll give you a sense of whether you're seeing rapid growth, uh, positive growth, slow growth, or declining populations. So, um, you know, for example, if you were looking at Italy or Russia, um, you're actually seeing a net decline in, po in, in populations based on the fact that the bigger populations are up here in the middle and smaller populations are falling behind it. Um, the same is sort of true for, for China uh, in general. So that's, uh, that's something that's, uh, that's ongoing uh, now. Um, in the United States, we're sort of in this sort of uh, slow growth uh, trajectory. Most of the developed nations, the Western Europe, uh, Canada, the US, Australia, um, are sort of fall into this, into this bracket. Um, there are a few countries like India, which are still considered, um, you know, relatively, uh, relatively, uh, um, developing nations and by and large that have uh, sort of a slow growth rate uh, distribution. But a lot of the uh, countries, developing countries such as those in, in Central Africa, like Kenya or, or Haiti are seeing growth and, and in, case, in this case, rapid growth where the, the number of people at a higher age is, is, is relatively low. Other factors you have to consider here, it's not just tied to fertility, there's also life expectancy in, in those areas. And, uh, and that's really what I'm trying to highlight in this next graph, which compares life expectancy, shown with years here on the y-axis, versus the, how that's evolved from the 1950s up to uh, projected to be by the end of this century. And you can see here now that the, the average life expectancy 
um, has increased over the last uh, century. Uh, um, in this case, a little bit less than century in terms of real data, uh, about a century in projections. And uh, what's uh, what's interesting to note there is that there still uh, is currently a large gap between more developed and less developed countries, and that gap is is getting a bit smaller in real data, projected to be smaller in the future, but still a fairly large gap in terms of how long individuals will will live, uh, will will live rather. Apologize, uh, will live uh, you know in developed or less developed nations. An interesting statistic uh, I, I, I always think about in terms of thinking about how long we're going to have to think about people living and needing resources on our planet is the fact that uh, there are there are today more people alive on planet Earth um, that are going to be over 100 years old, and there has been the summation of all the history of humanity. Basically, um, it's no longer uh, unusual to see people living 100 or 110 years old, which uh, is another factor in thinking about how long and how many people we're going to provide resources for moving forward. So the key aspect here is that um, even though the population is still increasing and will continue to increase probably towards 10 billion people by about 2060, um, the, the, great, the, the rate of population growth has actually started to decline. Uh, so this peaked following the baby boom times of, uh, of World War II up through, uh, up through about uh, you know, maybe 1990. Uh, the peak of the, the baby boom was 1957, actually, in America, but the, the global population peak was lagged behind that a little bit, about 1963. And we've been on a slow uh, rate of decrease in the growth rate. Now, uh, so, okay, you can see here that this growth rate is, uh, is projected out in, the, in, in real data projections declining, projected to be down about 0.6% uh, growth rate by 2050. But the key thing to remember here is that's actually still indicative of an increasing population, just a decreasing rate of increase, okay? So that's why we went from three to six billion in 40 years, and it's gonna take us much longer to go to 12 billion, and maybe we'll never get to 12 billion, but, um, but we're still increasing. And if you think about projecting this down to zero, that number goes at least through the end of the century, we're gonna see a positive, or predicted to see a positive growth rate. Um, so increasing population on, on, on planet Earth, barring any, uh, any bit, you know, huge pandemics or, or things like that. Um, I saw a question here about why is there a huge drop in, in 1960? And I actually don't have an answer for you there. I will, I will look it up over the weekend. I'll get back to you on that, but I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I can only speculate and I'll, uh, I'll get looking at that in a bit more detail. Sorry, I don't, sorry, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, so one of the questions, uh, I've already alluded to it in terms of thinking about, um, you know the, the need for sustainability to provide equal access to resources and a fair and you know a fairly distribute those resources to all of the global citizens and i think that's a that's an important and admirable goal and something we are certainly trying to strive for um but it might be a little bit challenging to think about why population growth or why more people on planet earth is is, is in itself a problem um not providing a value statement just saying it's it's hard to recognize or hard to realize the resources required for for all these individuals but uh um, you know, this is, this is an example here looking at uh, Mexico City, an area limit of Mexico City, and you can get a sense of uh, when you have large population growth, uh, how, how densely populated people, uh, populations can get in certain urban areas. One of the, the sort of mega trends, I'm a big fan of mega trends, the, the, the really big changing paradigms on planet Earth that are changing the way we live, changing the way we, we, we work, changing the way we survive and, and try to achieve sustainability is the development of mega cities. The bottom line is in the last 40 years, um, the, the vast majority of the world's population has moved to, to uh, larger and larger urban areas in, in fewer and fewer number of cities. We've, we've, we've concentrated in mega cities. Um, this is an example of Mexico City, one of the largest in the world. Uh, certainly a lot of the coastal cities in India, Pakistan, and China fall into this as well. And uh, this, this creates a, a whole series of sustainability-related questions that, that quite frankly are are, are, are difficult to, to uh, address. So, so maybe the question is, why is population growth a problem? And a few examples of why that is, is just simply by putting, by creating mega cities, by creating large concentrations or large urban areas where a lot of people cohabitate, um, there tends to be, a, there's a tendency towards pollution of the environment, be that surface water, groundwater, atmospheric contamination. Just uh, looking at this image here, you can get a sense of the amount of smog um, and, and uh, you know, sort of air pollution just from probably home heating and transportation or mobility 
um, you know, getting getting to work or getting to to uh, other aspects of life uh, creates uh, problems that get concentrated in certain areas and are really hard to to um, to to deal with. In fact, um, another major issue that faces a lot of uh, a lot of uh, cities and mega cities and urban areas in light of huge changes in population are that we we uh, we we as I mentioned in the last lecture we are both increasing in population and consuming more water and more energy per capita um, than we ever have. And as a result, uh, we produce more waste, uh, solid, solid and liquid waste in particular. Uh, so that's sewage, that's gray water, which is basically non-sewage, but uh, water that's contaminated by a variety of, um, variety of uh, processes. It can be anything from dirt to soap or something like that. And, and solid waste and such garbage are major concerns. It's often difficult to, actually build landfills, uh, build enough landfills or large enough landfills to handle uh, this hazardous waste, which creates a major crisis. We'll spend a lot of time on landfills later in the semester, but uh, you know, uh, suffice it to say, one of the biggest issues facing a sustainable society is figuring out what we're gonna do with all our, all our junk and all our trash uh, and, and you know, basically developing um, better strategies for things you've heard like recycle, reduce, and reuse. But uh, clearly, um, you know, in terms of, those components, the easiest to do is change, is to reduce. And uh, in, in reality, uh, our tendency for the last 50 years is not to be to reduce, but in fact, to go the opposite way, to consume more per, per capita in light of, you know, on top of the increasing population. The third, and this is mainly a theme of, this is a largely important theme of environmental geosciences, is, is that if you, if you have a, uh, a mega city or a large urban center that even doesn't rise to the level of being a mega city, when there are the natural disasters that inevitably affect our, our planet, uh, the population's exposure to those natural hazards can be exacerbated, okay? And this can come in a variety of different forms. You know, I'll, I'll use an ex the example uh, a little bit later of earthquakes in major, uh, uh, major urban areas. But when you pack people in as closely as this, often you're not uh, having them in, um, in homes that are as well fortified as well when you have major population growth. There tends to be a tendency, there, there tends, there's a tendency towards uh, slums and uh, apartment type building complexes, when the natural disasters are hit, they often lead to uh, an increased number of casualties. Um, they can come from immediate impacts, building falling down on top of individuals, um, you know, fires from gas pipeline ruptures and explosions, flooding that can, that can cause you know, mass drownings that might only affect a small number of people before. But the follow-on aspects of this is, are, are important as well, which is the fact that in uh, you know, the same hurricane in a rural area, People can, obviously, can often distribute themselves enough to, uh, to stay safe and avoid communication of diseases. And I'm not just talking about things like infectious diseases like COVID here, but just uh, things like contaminated drinking water from uh, overruns of landfills or overruns of sewage treatment plants can often lead to outbreaks of cholera and, uh, and uh, a variety of contagious you know, waterborne diseases shortly after these natural, natural hazards. So all these are intensified um, um, in, in light of population growth. And the last one, which is more, more nebulous, and actually, I think in, in a lot of places in the world, we tend to uh, forget about this anymore, particularly in the United States, where we import a lot of resources from outside, the, outside of our borders, um, there tends to be an over-exploitation of natural and non-renewable resources. So these can be things like coal, oil, or natural gas. They can also be things like water, quite frankly. Um, nowadays, many of the mega cities, or I went, actually, I'll, I'll take it back, many of the large urban areas in the United States uh, no longer actually have enough water, for example, locally. The water needs to be treated as a non-renewable resource. And as a point of fact, uh, you know, a lot of your larger urban areas, such as New York City, um, Washington, D.C., and, and you know, Los Angeles, of course, import their water from other parts of their states, but over great distances. Um, and there are additional examples of this, such as uh, even if we start thinking about moving away from oil and gas and trying to move towards some sort of more renewable energy resource like solar, uh, or, or electrical storage, energy storage and batteries, it requires things like rare earth elements, cobalt, lithium, and uh, those resources are, of course, have to be exploited from somewhere. So we'll come back to that later, but where I want to highlight with this idea of, you know, over-exploitation of natural and non-renewable resources is the fact that we have to really develop a concept around sustainability. We have to think about what our goals are and, and what are the efforts we're going to make to achieve that. So I wanted to put a few definitions here for you. The key thing here is that sustainability is a development which ensures that future generations will have equal access to the resources our planet offers. That's a, that's a goal 
And you can extrapolate that to, or extend that to say um, future generations in, you know, in all parts of the world, not just in, in one country or another. And the types of film that are economically viable, do not harm the environment, and are socially just. Those are two um, alternative definitions for sustainability. I won't, uh, I would accept either one on, a, on an exam or anything like that. Don't worry about that. But uh, they both give you different concepts here. But the key things I want to highlight is that it's not just whether we can make sure the environment stays uh, healthy. We need to make sure there's sustained economic viability of the process. If, if uh, as the tendency is, and particularly environmental sciences, if we can't make it break even or, or, or um, economically positive, it's often hard to sustain environmental things. Um, and I will talk about this a lot more throughout the semester, but here's an example of a, uh, of a large scale coal mining operation, um, deforestation. I think this is actually a gold mine. And this is a, this is a, a large uh, rare earth element mine actually in, in, in China. And uh, in all cases, uh, you can see where there's a pretty disruptive to the landscape, uh, obviously removed vegetation, soils, et cetera. And in effectively what we create here are, are what are largely called scars that are, they're not gonna become an arable um, um, portion, portion of land again that can be used for farming or, or living. In many cases, the long-term future of these best case scenario has become uh, another example of, of landfills. Um, on that topic, and I'll, I'll talk about this more in the semester, later in the semester as well, is that the, the issue with the, with the disconnect between harvesting resources at one location, transporting them to another location to use them in these large urban areas, is the fact that um, we, we, tend to, we have a tendency to have this sort of not my backyard mentality. We typically do not want mines to be near large urban areas or quarries and things like that. And as a result, even though these make you know, uh, pretty, pretty big scars on the earth's surface and, and are largely only usable for things like land, landfills and things like that, uh, that often can't be used for that purpose just because there's a large uh, geographical distance in many cases between them. And uh, as a result, they, they tend to just become uh, long-term uh, wards of the local governments that have to be managed as, uh, as uh, waste areas. So, uh, you know, in addition to something like harvesting mineral resources like that, there are some other example, important examples of sustainability um, regards to, with regard to land use that I want to highlight here. And one of the, the best examples you may, have, uh, you may have heard of the RLC it used to be, uh, you know, in, in my lifetime was a, a viable um, waterway on the border between Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. Uh, once it was a really popular tourist destination in the uh, in, uh, Soviet Union. And um, basically, uh, the region has been greatly damaged by human attempts to basically create irrigation, utilize water for other reasons um, than, uh, than, than the lake and, the, and, the, and obviously destroy the ecosystem in the process. So the reason the lake actually was changed was, was largely, to, uh, was largely uh, by diverting the water that was coming into the lake in order to use it for agricultural purposes. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a video here for, for a few seconds about, about uh, sort of the history of what happened here. Uh, you might enjoy having a break from me talking and hear somebody more articulate. So. One of the really neat things to, to do in Lansing is look at change through time, of course. And one of the most dramatic changes anywhere on the globe in terms of environmental change is the Aral Sea. And uh, the story is that the Aral Sea is an inland salt lake. Uh, at one time, it was a productive fishery uh, salt lake, though, so it wasn't a source of agricultural water. But the rivers that ran into it are a source of agricultural water, and they were also the source of all of the water in the uh, Aral Sea. It, all along the rivers, the Sir Daria and the Amur Daria, there's irrigation uh, that's been developed since the 1950s when the Soviet Union uh, had a big push. So there are irrigation fields uh, for, in some areas in large patches. Uh, and then in other places, just following close to the river, uh, just south of the lake is a massive area of irrigation. And all of this irrigation is taking all the water that was going to the lake, and the lake is dried up. And you can see just from 1999 forward that the North Arrow Sea, the small part of the top, is uh, shrinking for a while and then stays fairly stable. They banned that off from the southern lobe. And then the large southern lobe on the right-hand side completely dries up in 2009. Uh, it's made some recovery since then with some decent rain, but uh, they've pretty much written off the lower part of the lake is hopeless. It's, it's just going to be dry. And it has a real uh, negative impact on the area beyond the lake in that 
all of this, the uh, minerals that have dried in the bottom of the lake, and the pesticides and so on are being blown around the area, salinizing croplands and uh, causing health problems. In the uh, artifacts of the imagery, you can see some black areas where it's so bright and reflective off the minerals that are left behind as the water recedes that the uh, algorithm that we use to create the data perceives it to be a cloud and has taken the data out. Uh, but in fact, that's just the very white mineral uh, surface left behind as the water is receding. You might be inclined not to see the bigger picture, but when you can see the whole thing this way in Landsat, it helps really uh, bring together these connections of how, how things work. And, and uh, I think it helps for us to make better decisions when we can see things this way. So, so first, uh, my, my apology that the, uh, the video was hard to hear. I have to admit, I have a lot of anxiety about uh, teaching online and uh, working through the kinks. So I apologize for that um, and I'll make sure that's louder in the future. Um, I, I'll call your attention to, there's a few links down here. You can you can click on the lectures, uh, lecture slides or even uh, if you're watching the recording um, and you can you can uh, access them in terms of looking at the uh, Landsat images and, and it's really instructive even in your, your maybe your hometown or or really anywhere in the world you want to look, you can see how, how uh, land use changes and things like that or climate change have impacted the uh, the surface and the resources we're dealing with there. So again, I apologize. The video was hard to hear, and I'll, I'll take some corrective action for that moving forward. Another another example of uh, sustainability, which is which is fairly uh, commonly discussed, is the uh, the issue of fisheries. Now, this has been this is something where uh, there were major 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 declines in, uh, in uh, probably our in our parents' lifetime, um, which caused the uh, the fisheries to basically. Uh, uh, be overfished and cause major sort of irreparable damage to the to the fishery systems. So this is an example here of the, the Atlantic cod. So this is off of the you know the New England area of the United States and Canada. Uh, Cape Cod is named after the fact that it was a famous cod fishery, but it really extends all the way on the northeastern seaboard of the United States, from about from about New York City up to up to Newfoundland. And uh, this is an example of a uh, uh, area along the east coast of Newfoundland. And it shows here on the y-axis is the fish landings and tons of cod um, from about 1850 all the way up to about 2000. And you notice that the, the amount of uh, landings increased for, you know, a little, you know, moderate, modestly for most of the period. But around 1960, um, up through the early to mid-1970s, the, uh, the uh, or maybe up to about 1970, the amount of fishing uh, success in the landings of cod uh, increased dramatically by about a factor of four you know, three or four during that time period. And for a little while, uh, there was some realization that that was a problem and, and the fishery started to decrease back down to approximately its near levels. But by the early 1990s, the cod fisheries in this region basically had had uh, had died off. And, and then as a result, uh, the cod fisheries today remain a pretty uh, unviable fit, uh, system, which we'll talk about why in a second. But before I go on, um, I'll, I'll ask this rhetorically, given that we're not, there's only the opportunity to be together in person, but can anyone take a guess at why uh, why this happened? What are what are the, some of the uh, some of the reasons that the cod fishery actually started to, to suffer? The, the main reason, um, if you if you uh, have thought about, it, is actually increased technology that advanced the fishing capacities. A few of those are um, you know things like uh, nets, um, better better motors to actually transport uh, and fish more efficiently. We go out to go out fish, catch, come back drop off your materials and get your, your catch and go back out. Uh, so basically faster boats. And also um, people always love to talk about fish finders, but in fact, uh, it's probably not really relevant one. More it's about uh, decreasing the, the, the uh, habitat by being able to get out there more fishing and fishing in larger, longer distance commercial charters. So some summary information just to get you a sense of this here is that the, the cod populations are likely to never recover. Well, by 2007, with great um, efforts to uh, protect the fishery, minimize fishing, and actually stop fishing largely, the cod stocks in 2007 were back to only 1% of what they were in 1977. And if you look here, you remember in 1977, we already experienced a, starting to experience some decline. Um, so by, by most of this trend, um, most of this trend in here is not, was a realization that there was both a problem with the fishery and also the reality that people were fishing with better boats and, and nets and whatnot, but actually catching less fish because of the fact that uh, because of the fact that it was you know harder to get, and they're basically going more 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 nautical miles on the boat to get that that that, that uh, 
that bounty. And by the early 1990s, that entirely uh, collapsed. So even by 2007, with an extended period of no fishing in that region for cod, a lot of protection of cod, um, we're only back to 1% of what we were, um, you, know, at, you know, even after the peak. Um, and, you know, the main reason that, uh, that this cod population has to come back with uh, attempts to just, sh you know, basically preserve the fishery is the fact that, you know, highlights the third component of our, you know, our sustainability is thinking about this as, as systems. So the key aspect here is that the system itself has changed. We didn't, we didn't fish in this example in a sustainable manner. And the cod, which was previously the top tier, um, which pre was previously the top tier predator and fed, fed upon smaller prey, uh, such as herring and shrimp, it was no longer there. And once those cod were there, were no longer there to actually uh, sort of hunt the smaller prey, what ended up happening is various components like shrimp and herring um, populations expanded. They destroyed other things that they fed on in the ecosystem. And as a result, we really can't see, it's sort of like an invasive uh, plant species, if you will, but it's here it's an, ende it's an endemic uh, uh, sh uh, herring and shrimp species that just blew up in population and sort of outcompetes the cod. So uh, cod population hasn't really come back at all. Um, the best numbers I've seen, or most recent numbers I've seen from, are from 2015, and we're only back about, up to about 3% of the, of the pre-peak average now from what I saw in 2015. Um, but I'm not, it's not totally clear if that's tied to 1977 or to the, you know, prior to that date uh, in, in the paper. So, you know, cod fishing now, um, what they were doing, try to do it sustainably is uh, minimize uh, large-scale fishing in this region. Um, you have to have a certain size of catch to make sure they're, they're having an opportunity to breed. But still, the long, long trajectory here is that there probably will not be any great success in the cod fishery for a long time, just simply because we've, we've, re we've effectively removed their habitat by, by uh, allowing other species in the system to outcompete them for the key resources they need to survive. <clears throat> so what this hopefully does is highlight the need to consider things as systems. So the whole idea of a linked earth systems or a systems approach was really uh, an idea that came out of um, MIT Business School uh, quite, quite soon after World War II really, or maybe a little bit later than that. But for our purposes, it's been adopted in environmental sciences and environmental economics and, and really a lot of aspects of, uh, of um, sort of logical, logical thinking in, in various types of uh, um, uh, domains. But what I want you to do is sort of is think about this definition, which is a system is a term used for any complex whole with smaller connected parts working together. Obviously, we, we think about uh, cells, tissues, organs, you know, systems in our, in our, in our bodies. Uh, same is very much true for the environment. And the key aspect of the system is that usually a change or malfunction in any one of the parts can affect other parts of the system. It can also affect the system itself. You know, for obviously, if our, our, um, our cardiovascular system starts working, we can, we can die. We, have, we sort of know this implicitly, but it's actually been relatively recent in the last several decades, really, that, uh, that, that people started to think about environment in, in this way. Uh, it seems naive once, you've had, once people start to think that way, but in reality, that was the, the way people you know, we're thinking, oh, we're going we're gonna to stop cod fishing and cod will come back. Well, that, that didn't happen because the system was perturbed in an irreparable manner. So, you know, Earth systems, adapting the systems model, refers to the Earth's interacting physical, chemical, and biological processes. As we'll see as a sort of a sub-theme of our course throughout the rest of the semester, in all systems, we need to consider the physical, chemical, and biological factors, and all of them will, will, are interrelated and will, will feed off, and, and there'll be positive feedbacks off of each other. So, you know, in, in, in some sense, in an Earth system, uh, in environmental geosciences, we consider the geosphere, you know, the land, so that could be islands, continents, uh, whatever the case may be, the hydrosphere, which is the groundwater and ocean systems, the atmosphere, uh, the air we breathe and the, and the biosphere. And nowadays, in the last about five years or so, the, the big buzzword in environmental sciences uh, is that we, we no longer call us the Earth systems, we call it the critical zone. But for our class, I, I like to keep it simple with uh, thinking about the uh, population growth, sustainability, and systems approach, but recognize that some folks now call this Earth system the critical zone that encompasses all of these different subsystems together. So, um, you know, it obviously, in, as part of this, which we'll get through in the next lecture, is this includes the planet's natural cycles, such as the carbon, water, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur cycles, and all deep earth processes. Okay, so this can, 
This can be related to things like uh, volcanic eruptions, earthquakes, but all of these are gonna have positive feedback loops, which is we're gonna spend most of the rest of the semester discussing. So key thing I want you to remember here is we wanna think of this critical zone or these earth systems as a linked earth system in which physical, chemical, and biological processes will all be interrelated and uh, we'll, we'll have feedbacks on each other. So um, obviously somewhat rhetorical again, given the, given the nature of the online courses, but what does it? What does this? What does this image even show here? And uh, for those of you who have um, probably can look at this, most of you probably can recognize this as a coral. But what uh, you may not it may not be obvious to uh, untrained eyes that this is actually what's called a bleached coral. It's uh, it's lost its uh, capacity to uh, generate any photosynthetic, uh, you know, uh, energy and uh, and uh, basically it's, it's it has died. Um, so uh, you know the, the important thing here is that you know as once this happens, once we've lost the capacity to this coral to work, it's lost its ability to sort of purify the water and the, and the system. So one of the key aspects, we'll talk about why this is in a second, but this has itself has an impact on, on sustaining productive fisheries and no longer is there to filter the water. Um, obviously coral reefs are quite uh, popular and, and major tourist attractions, so this affects that. And the other aspect, and this is relevant when you start thinking about climate change and sea level rise, is that we've also lost the ability for these to be natural protective barriers for, for shorelines. So you can see once you perturb something by killing off coral, and we'll talk about why that is in a second, you start to impact the linked earth systems in a variety of different ways. So the, the key aspect we'll, we'll cover in terms of what's, uh, you know, what's causing this, uh, what perturbed the, the linked earth system to, to cause coral damage is related to increasing levels of CO2, which are absorbed by the world's oceans. So we all know, we are aware of the fact that we burn fossil fuels, emit them in the atmosphere, um, but what some of you may not be very familiar with is that the major mechanisms by which the earth handles carbon dioxide is either by um, evapor uh, sorry, by uh, photosynthesis, by uh, uh, sucking the CO2 into plant life, but also uh, a vast majority of it is actually uh, absorbed into the, the Earth's oceans. So about half of the, uh, half of the human related CO2 or about, um, now it's up to probably, you know, add another year, probably about 550 billion tons of of CO2 since the Industrial Revolution are actually absorbed by the ocean and, and dissolved into the ocean water. Uh, I'll spare you the boring details of this for now, but basically the CO2 dissolves into water, makes something called carbonic acid, and that carbonic acid actually uh, uh, dissociates into, um, into bicarbonate and, and, and hydrogen iron and acid. The key aspect of this, of course, is that we've increased the amount of CO2 in the ocean. That's one of the natural uh, feedback loops that can kind of accommodate increase CO2 levels. But the important part here is that by increasing the amount of acidity in the global oceans, uh, since it's being me been measured here, we've actually seen a decrease in the pH of the global ocean waters. So, uh, you know, down to about, from, you know, up from, or, sorry, down from about 8.16 pH units down to about uh, 8.05 pH units in the last, you know, 100, 175 years or so. While that might not seem like a lot, a 0.1 pH unit is about 26% increase in acidity. Um, and the key aspect here is that by increasing the acidity in those ocean waters, marine life is not really capable of adapting to these conditions. And it has a lot of effects on, uh, on biomineral formation, you know, for example, in, in things like corals. So, you know, for perspective, we dropped about uh, 0.1 pH units. That's led to acidity. And this is directly tied to increasing levels of, of atmospheric CO2 which increase the amount of CO2 in ocean water and lead to a decreasing pH in the associated waters. The realization here is that, um, the, you know, maybe, maybe we should have known this, but we really didn't probably think about it, is the fact that that causes the reefs that are calcium carbonate minerals to dissolve based on that acidic reactions much faster uh, than they can be rebuilt. Uh, it also causes the minerals themselves to lose biomass or lose mineral mass, which means that they're more susceptible to breaking down or being dissolved. Uh, to the point where forams, uh, foraminiferous shells, uh, carbonate shells, and, uh, and, and corals uh, often have weights that are 30 to 35 percent lower than their counterparts from a few thousand years ago, implying that this change in pH has actually, you know, uh, changed the way that uh, changed the way that the biomineral structure is formed and actually decreases the amount of biominerals in the in the shells and the spines of these these materials. So, um, you know, moving moving on from that. It's a, it's a major concern to understand how uh, th things related to um, ocean acidification are going are to play out in the long run. And, uh, you know, even if in light of 
uh, other aspects, you know, there's really not a very much optimism we can change the pH very quickly. So it's a long-term sustainability issue that we're sort of continuing to lead, be left trying to adapt to. I'm going to switch gears from, from that for a second. I'm actually going to go through another example of uh, uh, thinking about sustainability and linked current systems and the, the sort of the feedback loops uh, related to those things. And what we're going to do is actually zoom in on um, an area where, uh, where location, and that's mean, meaning geologic location as it relates to geological features such as faults in this particular case and, and climate in terms of rainfall and uh, geological evolution. Uh, conspire with uh, Mother Nature and, and humans to cause a lot of damage. And uh, hopefully this is another illustrative example of, of uh, feedbacks between these linked Earth systems. So for those of you who don't know, uh, Haiti and Dominican Republic actually sh uh, share the same um, um, landform, basically. Uh, Haiti is on the western side of the, land of the landform. Uh, the Dominican Republic is on the eastern side. I believe that uh, Haiti was a, was a French colony, and I think the Dominican Republic was a, a Spanish colony, but don't hold me to that. I, I know Haiti was a French colony. Um, and in, in essence, it actually provides an, an example of sort of a, a semi-ideal, you know, side-by-side -side comparison of how, you know, perturbing certain aspects of a linked art system can lead to very different uh, problems in terms of sustainability or even just survival for, for these folks. So here's one of those Landsat photos. You'll notice here the, the border. Uh, runs right through um, between Haiti and Dominican Republic here. And hopefully your eye, caught, uh, following along my, my uh, semi-effective laser pointer there, can realize the difference, the difference between very denuded or low vegetation, vegetation areas over here, a lot of absence of green in comparison to the Dominican Republic. So you look at the side-by-side -side comparison, just the geopolitical boundary, you see this area has a lot more vegetation, a lot more greenery, um, and seems to have a much more, you know, more, more forestation than, than, than Haiti, just on a first glance of the, the two regions. Um, another another uh, color uh, uh, filtered image here, you can probably get the, the sense that Haiti is largely deforested compared to the Dominican Republic um, and, and has quite a lot of different uh, aspects, but maybe, maybe before this class you may not actually have any indications of why, which we'll talk about in a second here. So in fairness to both locations, there is a, some physical difference between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. I said that they uh, share the same island, the same landform, but in reality, there's, there's much greater topography and much greater, more, more mountainous regions in Haiti than the Dominican Republic. So in essence, there is more flat land that's suitable to agriculture in the Dominican. Um, so that's a little bit of, a, of an advantage. And also, based on the wind patterns and the rain patterns in the, uh, in the Caribbean uh, Ocean, um, there are there is a tendency for more water to fall on the Dominican Republic than Haiti. So from, from the sort of mother nature perspective, Haiti was dealt a, a, little bit, uh, a little bit less of a good hand in the sense that it's not as well equipped for agriculture and uh, doesn't get quite as much rain, but the differences aren't entirely, uh, don't, certainly don't account for the difference in what we see in terms of productivity. Here's a, a, a bunch of information about uh, comparison between the areas of Haiti and Dominican Republic. You see they're fairly similar population, ages, um, but uh, a few of the things I want to highlight for you here are differences in things like population growth, uh, you know, not quite double the population growth, but, but a significantly higher population growth in Haiti compared to the Dominican Republic. So going back to the idea of uh, fertility rates and, and population growth rates compared to GDP, um, it is a scenario here, the GDP is a lot lower in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Haiti, as you can see here, almost four times lower in, in Haiti in the Population growth falls those statistics we talked about, but here's a here's a stifling uh, number, even just a four times difference in population in uh, domestic GDP gross domestic product, is the actual forest coverage. I mean, there's about you know nine times more forestation in the Dominican Republic than Haiti, and it might not be entirely obvious why, but we'll we'll go through that here in a second. So the implications of this, not just in terms of GDP, are that you see extensive deforestation in Haiti. Uh, because of deforestation, you've seen serious soil erosion. So the, there might have been dealt less uh, agricultural area, but more importantly, that agricultural area has been ruined by the fact that soils have been, been lost by erosion. And as a result, you have an inadequate uh, and, quite frankly, ins unsustainable water supply in the area. There can be some water shortages and, and other issues with these things in the Dominican Republic, but uh, um, one, one's faring a lot better than the other, and we'll go through why. So. You know, uh, this is just one example of a headline, is Haiti at risk of becoming a permanent failed state? Um, that's a question that's actually, quite frankly, still being 
being asked, and I, and I hate to say that uh, headlines like this are, are relatively common, but I think what we need to ask ourselves, other than those minor differences in geological factors, what happened to bring Haiti to this point? And the reality is it's, it's, a, it's a living example of uh, linked earth systems that indicate that a mixture of historical, social, geological factors all, all played a role. So a little background on the human side of how we got this wrong. Uh, in, in 1789, Haiti was the uh, sort of one of the crown jewels of the French uh, colonies. Um, it was very productive sugar uh, and, and, and lumber uh, region for them at that time. I think, I think there's some other resources there, but there mainly there was lumber and, and, and sugar. Um, and then basically by 1791, there was a horrifically bloody revolution in which Haiti fought for and won its independence uh, as the free uh, Haitian Republic. Uh, the issue was the fact that, you know, this entire, you know, human system, if you will, uh, led to a lot of mistrust between the two parties and, uh, and also, uh, you know, admittedly a major human aspect of this fact that uh, because there was a unique dialect in, in Haiti, there was a lot of communication problems between them and, and the French that uh, probably persist on. The problem here is that, um, the, the problem here is that once Haiti won its independence, France agreed to this uh, treaty in which they would provide the, or re would recognize their independence, but uh, they required a sum of about 150 million gold francs, which was later agreed upon to be reduced to 90 million francs. And Haiti, in an effort to pay off that debt, you know, as long back ago as 1804, basically felled uh, almost the entire uh, uh, population, the forest and population, uh, and exported to France in order to pay for the, for the debt service. And what happened once they did that is that once the deforestation occurred, you know, basically lumbering all the trees, selling the France to pay off their debt for their freedom, which is a horrific in so many ways, I'm just skipping over it for the moment. Um, what you saw is a reduction in soil quality. Uh, you saw about uh, a scenario where about 15,000 acres of topsoil um, is washed away each year. That continues on and on and on. Of course, in your, when you're trying to reestablish a forest, it's hard to do that with the decreasing, uh, you know, vegetation. Linking back to the, the mines and the quarries I showed you earlier, uh, these can be very hard to re, uh, rehabilitate because it takes a very long time for soil profiles to be developed. So obviously there's less agricultural production, which eventually leads to desertification. Um, and what happens when nobody can actually farm in rural areas or it's impossible to, to, to develop agricultural, sustainable agriculture in those areas? Everyone moves to population centers, right? That's the, that's the global tendency in a resource-strapped world that we live in. And that's certainly a population, and, and, and certainly the, the situation where, what the population did in, in Haiti in response to this. Um, so for starters, on the, on the areas um, around the country, there's an increased risk of landslides, uh, flash flooding becomes a bigger issue, um, and erosion continues on. But um, really, where this all comes together, back to the environmental geosciences, is the fact that, in, in the early parts of this lecture, is that what we created is a, a mega city called Port-au-Prince, Haiti. Um, sadly, most of that megacity was accommodated by developing uh, sprawling, sprawling slums of sort of stick-built uh, houses, typically without foundations or structures. And um, if, you're, if you remember this, what happens when we, when we do that, when we concentrate a large number of people in certain areas, is that we prepare ourselves for, for greater devastation from the sort of episodic nature of uh, natural disasters. And uh, those of you probably are old enough to remember, all, I think are all old enough to remember this, when Haiti was devastated by a magnitude 7.0 earthquake, it was a pretty big earthquake, but not by any means the biggest earthquake we could have expected. Um, but what, but what uh, you may not know is that the, the, the city of Port-au-Prince, where everyone happened to cohabitate and form a, a mega city, um, uh, was actually right on a major fault line. So there's a major plate boundary in the Caribbean, uh, between the uh, Caribbean and the Gonabi uh, microplate, um, fairly active, uh, pretty uh, active pretty frequently in terms of geological time. And of course, the city was built right next to this plate, almost maximizing the effect of the devastation. So many of the areas had severe damage uh, in an in a utterly horrifying scenario. Um, 230,000 people were killed, uh, 300,000 injured, and the number of people that were uh, killed as a resulting follow on, lack of access to water or waterborne diseases from drinking poor quality water, um, violence, et cetera, um, are really honestly quite poorly quantified and, and uh, are major aspects of the casualties that we just don't, we don't, we don't really have good numbers on. So I'll give you a perspective here, similar earthquakes in China, one in, every, one in 595 people died, 
in Italy, there was a series of earthquakes about 2013, 14. One in 190 people that were affected by that earthquake died. And astonishingly in Haiti, given all this sort of linked earth systems that led to this scenario, one in 15 people affected by the earthquake living within the earthquake damage zone actually perished from the, um, this earthquake in, in Port-au-Prince. So, you know, one of the factors, it hit a large urban area. Um, many people were living in poorly constructed houses, you know, in light of, you know, sort of, uh, you know, following the example I, I suggested in regards to forming uh, mega cities from, from these, uh, these areas, you know, in, you know, in light of all these other sustainability problems. And uh, in, in reality, there really wasn't a great, uh, in light of, you know, largely um, poor GDP and, and uh, lack of uh, federal government systems, there really was a limited federal rescue effort to, that could be, in, 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 you know, enacted in this area to, to make it work. So, you know, uh, we're going to wrap up for today. Key concepts here, lack of sustainability, um, deforestation, lack of access to good water, lack of our agriculture led to a really poor economy. Poor economy le leads to everybody moving to, you know, large urban areas and mega cities around the world, over concentrates people in a certain area. That, in light of population growth, led to far too many people living in, in slums where there's, you know, uh, where they're susceptible to, uh, you know, uh, horror from one of these natural events. And then once the natural hazardous earth process is kicked in, uh, Port au Prince, which is located along those fault, uh, actually uh, ended up being pretty. Uh, um, affected them to a much greater extent than probably would have expected in most parts of the world. We'll come back to this later, but, you know, clearly this part, um, you know, building a mega city on a fault line is something we as uh, environmental geoscientists, we can, we can think of ways to mitigate, but uh, you'll probably won't be surprised, that, you're, you probably will be surprised to realize throughout the semester that's a far too common occurrence to build major cities along these uh, geological areas, which we'll talk about more as, as the semester goes on. So, you know, we're all we're all in just to, just because we don't feel like these folks had it bad enough. Um, you know, uh, not no, not to make a joke of it, but adding insult to injury. Um, you know, of course, not very long after this, Hurricane Irma came came through, and uh, the reality is the the area really hadn't even uh, recovered from from the uh, the earthquake in Port Prince, and then there was additional damage from Hurricane Irma. Uh, so, you know, I guess the closing lecture, I'll uh, the closing uh, lesson I'll leave is that. We can't really prepare for the natural disasters in the, in a full extent. There are always the different aspects that can affect us. But um, thinking about managing population growth, uh, thinking about sustainability, and then realizing that there are linked air systems will better prepare us to make sure we have a uh, framework in order to handle these as best as we can, so some adaptability. So uh, that's the end of the lecture for Monday. We'll start on uh, age and evolution of the Earth and start getting into Earth systems and processes to give you a sense of how this whole big blue body works in order to get a sense of where we're gonna try to build sustainability and an understanding of linked earth systems. I should post the lecture by Sunday, um, and I will also post your next worksheet on Sunday, which we do by, by Friday at midnight. As a reminder, worksheet one, hopefully it's really easy and hopefully everyone gets all the points, uh, but that is due by midnight tonight. Um, and I uh, hope everyone has a great weekend. If you have any questions, uh, shoot me a message on chat or on email. Uh, I don't have office hours after class today, but I will, I will actually be around for a little bit. I can answer questions if anyone has any. Uh, all right. Have a great weekend. Thank you very much.